to be alive good evening all welcome to i focus online lecture 289 the 30th in the uvm module today we have with us the very learned dr reema bansal ma'am from advanced eye center pgi chandigarh to speak to us on surgical management of uveitis including vitreous and choroidal biopsy it's a pleasure to have ma'am on the platform today and may i now request dr partho sir to please introduce reema bansal ma'am good evening friends this is indeed a honor for me to introduce my senior dr reema bansal who is a professor in uveitis and vitreoretina services at advanced eye center pgi chandigarh she has 156 publication in peer reviewed journal 27 chapters in books 182 guest lectures in national and international conferences 12 awards to her credit including carl p harbert best paper award jm pato pawa best paper award and aios reema mohan award for best paper also she received award of appreciation by pgi in in the year 2013 2016 and 2019 she is an elected member of international uvit study group national academy of medical sciences she is also reviewing editor of ocular immunology and inflammation a very prestigious journal in uvitis she is also sub editor in indian journal of ophthalmology Com committee member of iusg education committee iuvri and us usc con 20, uh, 2023 scientific committee and various other committee so so we are waiting to uh, listen to you ma'am uh, who will be talking on surgical management of uveitis over to you ma'am so thank you very much uh, dr parthu for this kind introduction and thank you um, uh, dr honavar for this initiative and for having me here to talk on the i focus platform um, on the surgical management of uveitis so i hope my slides are seen yes ma'am so when it comes to the surgical management of uveitis we have various kinds of surgeries pertaining pertaining to the patients having uveitis most important the vitreous surgery and we also have anterior segment surgery for various indications in uveitis and a bit of i'll talk about the extraocular surgery in these patients so coming to the vitreous surgery in uveitis the very first demonstration of an improved visual outcome following a pars plana vitrectomy with lensectomy in patients of uveitis was demonstrated way back in 1979 when it was postulated that removing the vitreous gel alone was therapeutic in uveitis so vitreous surgery in uveitis can broadly be of two indications diagnostic and therapeutic therapeutic further can be classified for improving media opacities or for certain complications of uveitis so when it comes to diagnostic pars plana vitrectomy we have various indications like when we have a patient of intermediate posterior or pan uveitis of unknown or sus suspected origin where the conventional methods like the clinical assessment and the laboratory investigations fail to determine the diagnosis or when we have a strong suspicion of intraocular malignancy a potentially site threatening acute uveitis with a negative non invasive laboratory and ancillary investigations also when we have an atypical presentation of uveitis when we want to have a quick diagnosis so uh, pre operative preparation is very important in these patients we need to have a detailed clinical history complete ocular examination before we go in for surgery general physical examination for vital clues and only relevant ancillary and laboratory tests depending upon the kind of uveitis the patient has so uh, we have a list of differentials of course when we plan a diagnostic vitrectomy in these patients but we need to have a very clear plan by the uveitis expert about what tests can be done and should be done and since the main aim is to subject the sample the vitreous sample for diagnostic tests we must inform the microbiologist and the pathologist before taking the patient even planning the patient for surgery so because their laboratory should be ready to receive and process the samples and we need to take utmost care to transport the samples to the concerned laboratory as soon as possible and under of course optimal conditions so that the cells do not degenerate a written informed consent is very important uh, before such kind of surgeries 
to explain the nature of the surgery and the likely complications. And we must inform the patient that there is a high likelihood of having no definitive results in the test report. The, we can do a vitreous biopsy, a retinal biopsy, or a subretinal biopsy. Now, the various tests that we subject these samples to include polymerase chain reaction-based methods. We do cytology on these samples. These samples are, can be tested for smear or culture, especially in patients of endophthalmitis. For immunohistochemistry and flow cytometry, where we are suspecting some kind of masquerade, cytokine level analysis, of course, these investigations are tailored to the patient profile. Now, sample collection and transport is very important. In fact, it is the most important step in these um, vitrectomy, diagnostic vitrectomies. We must keep a syringe ready, which is to be collect which is collecting the sample, and the syringe is attached to the uh, soft tip via a tubing so that you have a good flexibility in collecting the sample and the assistant is holding the syringe. So there is a comfort level between the assistant and the surgeon. The syringe on the right just shows the label should be ready and it should be a broad label where you can have the name of the patient, the ID of the patient, the date of sample collection and the records of the patient and whatever sample you want to order. So that name of the test is written on the uh, label. General principles we need to follow in the operating uh, room. The trolley must be prepared well. The number of syringes that we are planning for, for collecting the samples should be kept ready. And care should be taken not to have these syringes with a pre-filled air because once you are atta attaching these syringes to the aspiration tube, the system might incidentally inject instead of aspirating. So you have a lot of air going into the vitreous cavity, which causes harm to your surgery. So we follow a standard 25 gauge or a 27 gauge pars planar vitrectomy. About 0.1 ml of undiluted vitreous sample can be collected under ideal conditions. And about 4 ml of vitreous fluid can be collected under dilution, dilution uh, and direct visualization in sterile syringe, syringes attached to the aspiration port of the vitreous cutter. And the samples are transported to the laboratory, the concerned laboratory in cold chain. And immediately the samples need to be transfer to the microcentrifuge tubes for diagnostic and research purposes. Now, this is the uh, this is just to show that the collect the syringe where which in which we are collecting the vitreous sample is connected to the aspiration port of the cutter. And this is the this the assistant holds the syringe and gradually aspirates the sample. Uh, full light is on. We don't. It's not a good idea to keep the uh, uh, OR in dark, so that the the assistant can see how much sample is being collected in the syringe, and also it gives an idea about the nature of the sample that is being collected. So similarly, number of syringes depends how much you want. So two or three syringes, and this is how the samples are collected. And the surgeon goes back to vitrectomy once the samples are collected. So these are the syringes that we have collected in this patient with adequate labeling, and these are transferred in cold box to the concerned laboratory. The undiluted sample, uh, is collected under air. You can see we are making the 25 gauge port. The infusion is connected to the port, but we do not switch on the infusion. And once we make the other two ports, we start the vitrectomy, core vitrectomy, and you can see the gas bubble now getting into the vitreous cavity the moment we start the uh, vitreous uh, sampling. So this is the collection of the undiluted vitreous sample under direct air. And once we have collected this, we switch on the infusion and then do a core vitrectomy for the diluted vitreous sample collection. So depending upon what cut rates are uh, to be chosen, dep uh, they uh, depend upon the surgeon, but most of the times uh, it is the, of course it is the preference. If you keep a high cut rate, uh, the higher the cut rate, the smaller the bite size from the cutter tip. So the lesser amount of vitreous gets aspirated into the cutter for any one particular cut. So some surgeons prefer high cut rate to reduce the tractional complications, which remain a major concern in uveitis. If you keep a low cut rate, it facilitates a larger bite size. 
It increases the vitreous yield, so many surgeons prefer this, but it increases traction on the vitreous and the retina. So we must decide what cut rate we are doing before starting the vitrectomy. The sclerotomy port closure is uh, an important step because you can, we can keep them sutureless, but since these eyes are compromised, there is a lot of inflammation going on in the eye. Even you're operating in, in an inactive uh, eye with inactive uveitis, but it's a good suggestion to keep, to close, uh, to suture these pores because you don't want any um, complication next day like hypotony or choroidals. So it's a good idea, just an advice that, you, you know, these, these pores should be uh, sutured at the end of the surgery. So uh, moving on from diagnostic indications, uh, there are a lot of therapeutic benefits of vitrectomy in uveitis in the terms of there is visual improvement because you know, you're know you removing the inflamed vitreous. There is decrease in inflammatory activity. It, we have also experienced there's an early discontinuation of steroid therapy in these patients and a decreased use of immunosuppressive therapy. And this is based, from, uh, based on our own experience of microincision vitreous surgery in uveitis. So coming to the core vitrectomy, which we are doing for therapeutic and of course, and diagnostic purposes, uh, one of the indications is visual improvement. Like this was an elderly man who presented with bilateral, few KPs in the eye, loss of vision, chronic going on for six months, 636, 624 vision. There was not much reaction in the interior chamber. But when you look at the fundus, there is a lot of vitritis. You can see prominent vitreous membranes. We are even not able to uh, you know, examine the fundus. So we tried to do an OCT in both the eyes. We couldn't get any scans because there's so much of haze and it was not the lens. The lens was quite clear. Fluorescein and geography did not give us anything. We could just barely visualize the vessels and we could not really make out despite the basic tests, you know, what the patient fits into. He has pan uveitis, posterior uveitis. We had no idea. So uh, we took up the patient. We counseled the patient for the need for diagnostic vitrectomy. Here, the plan was diagnostic but it turned out to be therapeutic. I'll show you how. So the patient did not have any systemic complaints. And, you know, we were thinking of infectious, non-infectious, masquerade, any possibility. So we took up the samples for PCR, cytology, cytokines. And, you know, we did the fundus examination intra-op thoroughly up to the periphery, but we did not find any subretinal lesions intraoperatively. Surprisingly, the vitreous, just the vitreous, we didn't have to do any retinal or a subretinal biopsy here. Just the vitreous fluid sampling on cytology revealed a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And even on flow cytometry, the IL-10 ratio to IL-6 was high. So this was a case. And but subsequently, when we got the MRI brain, there was a lot of involvement, despite the fact that the patient did not have any neurological symptoms. So this was a case of an intraocular lymphoma. Uh, leading on to the diagnosis of CNS lymphoma. And you can see uh, on the left, we have the pre-op in the right eye. On the right, we have the post-op in the right eye. The vision has improved. Even the OCT scans, you can see the quality, the, they have improved so much. Similarly, in the left eye, um, 636 vision pre-op, post-op 69 vision, you can see the fundus very nicely. Similarly, the OCT scans are so good. So even the uh, transient therapeutic effect of vitrectomy has been published in primary intraocular lymphoma, which we also experienced from our case. Symptomatic improvement is again very uh, beneficial from some of these patients undergoing therapeutic vitrectomy. This was a woman we had with bilateral fuchsiviitis, very classical presentation you can see. And there were a lot of uh, uh, vitreous membranes in both the eyes. Um, uh, you know, the fluorescein showed a hot disc. And these, um, her main complaint was floaters. So we took up the patient for a uh, vitrectomy, core vitrectomy, which we call as floaterectomy. So she was 636 before the surgery. And, you know, she was 66. You can see intense clearing of the media. And she's symptomatically very happy uh, in her right eye. And she herself asked us, please uh, operate in my left eye also. And that's what we did subsequently. This was a young girl, um, decreased vision, right eye, three months, had pan uveitis, not fitting into GIA. Um, she had AC cells, posterior sinecki. 
vitreous haze and there was cystoid macular edema on OCT, although the OCT scan was quite hazy. So um, we got the CT chest done where we found some mediastinal lymph nodes. And this was the Montux, which was necrotic. And um, because uh, her media was very hazy and we really couldn't see what's there in the fundus. So we took her up for a vitrectomy, diagnostic as well as therapeutic. And you can see intraop, there is a lot of, there are, the vitritis is significant. But what's more important is, which we would not, could not have seen pre-op, um, uh, you can see these exudates on the retinal surface. Um, the inf entire inferior retina is full of these exudates, which are very much, you know, perivascular. So the intra-op examination sometimes helps us a lot, which we are not able to do by our imaging, by our clinical examination. Um, here, the PCRs were negative all we got because we had no clue what's going on except the necrotic montux that we had. She was a young girl. So IL-6 was high, uh, indicative of inflammation, cytology, no uh, non-contributory. So, but the intraoperative findings told us there were perivascular infiltrates, there were patches of focal retinal vasculitis. So our suspicion of TB was strengthened by the intraoperative findings. We again, uh, you know, I talked about the necrotic montux. So we started the patient on ATT and uh, our, uh, she responded very well. So if we had not uh, uh, operated and just in the presence of a dense vitritis, we could have given a trial of oral steroid, but that, you know, that takes a long course and the patient benefited a lot from the vitrectomy in this patient, uh, in this case. So control of infection is again um, a very important uh, indication for vitrectomy. This lady presented with a hypopion uveitis since one week, decreased vision, only hand motions. So when we dilated the fundus, fundus we could just see a yellow glow. No details could be seen. Ultrasound showed exudates. We took up the patient immediately. Here, in these cases, we don't really wait. So we operate the patient on the same day or maybe the next day. And we uh, did the vitreous biopsy. The uh, QH smear showed septate hyphae. So our uh, provisional diagnosis was left eye endogenous fungal endothelmitis. And uh, uh, the PCR also, uh, pan fungal PCR was positive. So you can see uh, slowly she started recovering. And by day 10, her exudates were much, much less. And we could have a view of the fundus. And she was getting antifungal treatment. And by day 14, we also had the culture report where the media had also improved in classical presentation of an aspergillus uh, fungal endophthalmitis. So not only control of infection, but we can also have a control of the spread of infection. You know, we have a tiny infection coming within the eye. We had this patient, a young, uh, a middle-aged man with a focal foveal uh, kind of retinitis. And the OCT showed that, you know, this retinitis was just bursting through the fovea, coming from the choroid, involving the entire retinal layers. He was a known case of uh, swine flu. Uh, his H1N1 was, was positive from the throat swab. And uh, thinking of the possibility of influenza, you know, because of this uh, background history, uh, we started the patient on oral steroids. And so you can see the baseline on the left side. But with oral steroids, on, in five days, the patient worsened. His vision went down. And even on OCT, rather than the vertical spread, we could see the um, uh, horizontal spread of these exudates on the uh, subret in the subretinal area as well as on the uh, surface of the retina, that is in the uh, on the hyaloid surface. So we had no choice, but we took him up for uh, surgery, and we had no clue what's going on. So we took him up for a vitrectomy. Here, the challenge was uh, that the th these exudates were sitting right on the surface of the retina. So core vitrectomy would not really have helped. So we planned a core vitrectomy and gently lifted this hyaloid and aspirated these um, exudates directly into the soft tip and sent these exudates lying over the fovea to, the, uh, to our colleagues in microbiology. And the QH smear of those exudates revealed septate branching hyphae. Pan fungal PCR was positive and the blast analysis showed that this was a candida albicans infection. So we started the patient on antifungals, and you can see before vitrectomy, the exudates are so many in the vitreous on the surface of the retina. And after vitrectomy, two months, you can see the entire uh, infection is, you know, kind of controlled. So here we were able to control the spread of the infection, which was nothing but a focal fungal retinitis, which would have blow, gone into full-blown endophthalmitis. So this prevented us from, you know, this major catastrophe by the timely intervention through vitrectomy. Subretinal biopsy is again a challenging surgery, 
but very beneficial where it is indicated. So we have to have very clear indications of having patients subjecting, subjecting the patients to subretinal biopsy. So these kind of exudates, if you have very clearly subretinal, not even intraretinal or preretinal, you can see the vessels crossing, you can see the exudates scattered all over. So these are the patients where we are suspecting lymphoma. Of course, we need to do an OCT scan, which shows sub-RPE deposits. And this was a patient from uh, um, our own uh, clinic. Uh, this was under Dr. Professor Amor Gupta, where the biopsy was done. And you know the uh, so red subretinal fluid aspirate showed uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So this was uh, very contributory in the sense that we didn't get anything from the vitreous cells. We didn't get anything from the retinal biopsy. And we got only from the subretinal fluid aspirate. So this was a learning lesson where a primary intraocular lymph CNS lymphoma masqueraded as a diffuse retinal vasculitis and you know, started showing the subretinal uh, exudates much later during the course. Cororetinal biopsy is a highly invasive uh, procedure, should be done only by experienced vitreoretinal surgeons. And you must have availability of a competent pathologist because you can't afford to let these samples go unnoticed and go waste. And you can either do by a transcleral, which is an external approach, or a vitrectomy, which is the internal approach. But this internal approach is much preferred over the external approach. Um, uh, routine vitrectomy is done in chorioretinal biopsy. The subretinal tissue aspiration is uh, done as the lymphoma cells are friable and soft, and they are directly sent for the uh, analysis. The laser is done around the site of biopsy, followed by internal tamponade, which may be gas or oil, depending upon the site of biopsy. Complications can be dreaded and need to be kept in mind, choroidal hemorrhage or a retinal detachment or an inadequate sample. So these kind of surgeries need meticulous planning um, by, the, by the surgeon as well as by the pathologist. Now, some of the indications in uveitis for surgery are the complications of uveitis, and the commonest is tractional or combined retinal detachments resulting from retinal vasculitis. So this is the patient on the top. You can see there is vitreous hemorrhage, there is TRD, there is subhyloid hemorrhage, and the one on the right uh, is uh, the uh, follow-up after vitrectomy, release of these tractional components, and adequate laser in the patient is doing very fine. So this was another case with a massive uh, tractional retinal detachment, secondary to retinal vasculitis. And you can see if the surgeries are planned well, done well, the outcome is very um, good. So this was a challenging case, a male who some, sometimes we don't know when we have to operate. And this is not a clear-cut indication where I would say a diagnostic or a therapeutic, but when we saw this patient was worsening, we took him up for surgery. So I'll tell you how. This was a 48-year-old male who presented to us with hand motions, vision in the left eye. The IOP was not measurable. The eye was very soft. There were cells, there was a lot of arthritis, and there is retinal detachment. So this patient had undergone two years, uh, probably he was, I think, 20 years he had been undergoing treatment from here and there. And finally, he was referred as an exudative retinal detachment. Because he had Montux positive, somebody had given him ATT elsewhere. You know, he was also converted to an MDR-TB uh, uh, regime. So as I said, almost 20 years, he had poor vision in the side. He was treated as TB neuroretinitis, sometimes uh, uh, elsewhere in Punjab. He had fair response to oral steroids. He was, his ATT was started, LFT deranged, and he was shifted to MDR-TB treatment. So number of investigations he was carrying when he already came to us. So he was subjected to all kinds of tests, toxo, TB, and everything, and some of them were positive. So he was a kind of cocktail for uveitis where nobody knew what's happening. So when, you, you know, when we were seeing this patient, we... Uh, realized we since we knew he had himself told that you know I sometimes respond very well to steroids so we gave him a trial of oral steroids and his vision uh, still was counting fingers at one week IOP was two at least this time we could measure but what we noticed at this visit was you can see by the arrows there was a large lesion in the upper nasal periphery and now the um, detachment is very prominent and when we saw this last large lesion our working diagnosis this time was a uh, suspect we suspected toxo. So we added septron to his regime and stopped his ATT, which he was taking. And you know, when we were planning, we need to go in, we saw there was a retinal break at the edge of the toxo lesion upper nasal periphery. 
So for us, this was a case of a regmatogenous retinal detachment and we operated this patient for vitrectomy, buccal and gas tampona. And you can see at six weeks, his vision improved, his retina is nicely attached. And this is the receding gas bubble at nine weeks. His vision is one meter because he has a lot of these scars in the macula as well. And he's off treatment. So this is what he had at baseline where we had no clue what's going on, but the surgery helped us and the patient very much. So this was the patient uh, girl we took up for thinking of cataract. We really didn't, to be honest, we didn't think it was, we were dealing with an eye of uveitis. So this was a total cataract with retinal detachment on ultrasound. And uh, uh, we removed the uh, cataract. We uh, planned a combined surgery. And uh, there was an intra-op, there was total RD with fibrosis. You can see there's a lot of fibrosis, not a very good prognosis case, but we saw there was a large cyst beneath this fibrosis, and this was a cyst of cysticercosis. So we removed this uh, cyst by uh, vitrectomy underneath a massive fibrosis. So the visual potential was quite bad, but these are some of the intraop surprises you get uh, in patients of uveitis. So this was uh, relating to the vitreous surgery, various indications, diagnostic and therapeutic. So of course, we have uh, anterior segment surgeries in uveitis and we know uh, most of them are for cataract, but coming to the aqueous biopsy, uh, more commonly performed procedure than vitreous biopsies in many centers where they don't have access to the uh, vitrectomy. So aqueous samples are sent for PCR analysis in endophthalmitis. They are helpful for smear and cultures and some of the masquerades, uh, cytology in IL-6 and IL-10 ratio. So we use a 1cc tuberculin syringe and you can aspirate up to 100 microliters and you can do 50 microliters twice. Don't have to do puncture twice. You can just do it uh, with the same puncture, wait for the pressure to build. So once you have aspirated 50 microliters, uh, you can wait and then just wait for the uh, pressure to build for the aqueous again to form and then you again aspirate. So it's a safe procedure. Don't have to make multiple punches and then send these uh, samples for the uh, investigations. So this is a very um, uh, challenging case we had where we had uh, to take uh, the patient again for surgery. So this was a 33-year-old male pa patient who, present, who had a car, car tire blast injury. He had undergone a primary repair for a zone one open lobe injury and during which the foreign body was removed from the uh, anterior chamber and he was, uh, he came, this was done elsewhere. So when he came to us, he had this large uh, kind of abscess on the uh, pupillary margin. And this is the anterior segment OCT just to show that this abscess or whatever granuloma this was, was abutting the lens surface. So uh, for us, it was not a very good uh, uh, idea to aspirate or to grab this exudate because it was touching the lens and the patient was a young male, clear lens, we didn't want to harm the lens. So um, uh, 636 vision, we started thinking of it as probably he had another foreign body. It was a foreign body granuloma. We started topical steroids in frequently and he worsened at one week and he came back with a big hypopion. Uh, so we had to take the patient. Uh, again, the, we could see the media and we did ultrasound also. There were no vitreous exudates. So this was not an endothelmitis uh, as far as we thought at this point of time. But since his uh, exudates were abutting the lens, uh, we counseled the patient. We had no choice. We took him up for a lensectomy and vitrectomy. And this is his post-op course, three weeks post-op. You can see the hypopion has gone and uh, his media is grade one. Fundus was normal and he was 6'9 uh, vision with the fake egg glasses. And his uh, this exudate that we grabbed from the interior lens surface was subjected to smear and culture and uh, it showed the report of parathyroidaria percutanea. And this is a kind of... Uh, this is the first case of endophthalmitis. We searched the literature and we didn't find any report of this fungus causing the endophthalmitis. So basically, this exists in environment as a plant saprophyte. And among different species, this parathyroidia, thyroidaria, percutanea is the only recognized opportunistic human pathogen. The traumatic implantation of this fungus, especially in patients who are strolling barefoot or working in the fields, is considered to be the root of infection. And we assume since our patient had history of trauma, so this was the uh, exogenous entry that got into the patient's eye and caused endophthalmitis. 
Cataract surgery in uveitis, I'll not go into the details. That's the domain of the cataract surgeons. But what is important is whether it should be done with IOL or without IOL. Of course, in adult patients, IOL is the choice. But now from our own experience, we've realized that if you're operating a patient of complicated cataract in a GIA uveitis, these patients should undergo surgery without intraocular lens implantation. I'll show you why. This was a boy, 21-year-old, who had undergone bilateral cataract surgery. You can see the right eye had this, the IOL is there in place, and there's a lot of dense PCO. We took him up for a membranectomy, but this was post-membranectomy um, uh, picture. So you can see he's as bad as he was pre-op. And the left eye, also he had undergone cataract surgery with IOL, where he developed a lot of fibrosis in front of IOL, behind the IOL, the IOP started going down. So his left eye became blind. So what you're seeing in the left eye is kind of a seclusio, occlusive pupil, pupillae, and this is a pseudophagic eye. We couldn't do anything. There were a lot of vessels going on the surface of the uh, uh, pacification of the IOL. So we didn't touch the left eye. So we counseled him. He was scared. He was a young boy, only one eye. We counseled him. Uh, we couldn't uh, improve him with the uh, surgical membranectomy, so we took him up for the IOL explantation, which has its own challenges because you have these haptics embedded in the fibrosis and you know you may cause uh, iodolysis, you may cause ciliary body detachment, you may cause a retinal dialysis or a giant retinal tear. So all these things have to, kept, have to be kept in mind. So we operated this patient under all this counseling pre-op uh, uh, concentrations and we were able to remove the intraocular lens removed the capsule and made the patient a fake egg. And he now has a two or three month follow-up. And this is how he is. 612 vision with a fake egg glasses. His fundus is normal and he's very happy. Although his, we couldn't save his left eye. So this, these are some of the challenges that we have to take and we have to try if we have to give vision. So wiser by our own experience, IOLs are a strict no-no in patients of GIA uveitis. So this is our approach. Now this is again a patient of blouse syndrome. A girl who now is with us for the follow for almost 16 years. So she developed this complicated cataract. She had glaucoma also. You can see a large PI in the upper temporal quadrant, surgical PI she had undergone. So now she developed a lot of cataract and we had to take her up for surgery. We didn't plan any IOL. We simply did lensectomy and interior vitrectomy. And this is what she is. Uh, this was post op. And now she's um, six, uh, I think, 612 with the fake glasses and she's quite happy because these patients usually do not have posterior segment involvement. So if you take care of the interior segment nicely, they do well. So coming to one of the extraocular surgeries, we had this girl with uveal effusion syndrome. So I'll just show you, this is uh, her diagnosis was made, made based on her clinical picture on the OCT and the MRI um, orbit that we got, which showed uh, scleral thickening. So we took her up for um, uh, subscleral sclerectomy So we made the uh, windows in the two uh, inferior, uh, inferonasal and inferotemporal quadrant. This is in the second quadrant. So this is to egress the fluid in the suprachoroidal space. And this is closure of the flaps. And this is the hypotony which we expect at the end of the surgery, but it builds up. And this is the post-op. And if you compare it with pre-op, this is how. So subscleral sclerectomy benefits these patients of uveal effusion syndrome. So complications coming back to vitrectomy again, complications of vitrectomy and uveitis have to be kept in mind. There may be progression or development of cataract if these eyes are phakic. And uh, varying rates, higher rates have been reported previously. But with microincision vitreous surgery, we found only 14% uh, rate of progression or development of cataract in these eyes. Unusual post-operative IOP responses may be there in terms of uh, uh, mostly hypotony, but IOP may be raised. You can have bleeding intra or post-operative. You can have an exaggerated inflammatory response, which is rare, but it may happen. And transient hypotony may be there in the early post-operative period following a completely sutureless MIVS. Hemorrhagic, the other uh, um, complications are rare, but have to be kept in mind. Hemorrhagic choroidal detachment, retinal detachment, epiretinal membrane, vitreous hemorrhage, hypotony, and post-operative endophthalmitis. Benefits of vitrectomy in uveitis, apart from diagnostic, as I showed you, 
are in terms of visual improvement, decrease in the inflammatory activity, and early discontinuation of steroid or immunosuppressive therapy. So key points is microincision vitreous surgery is safe and efficacious and well tolerated by majority of these eyes with uveitis, even if you operate them in the stage of active uveitis. Uh, but we need to have a very clear preoperative plan by the ophthalmologist who's dealing with these patients. The lab should be ready by the microbiologist and the pathologist because they are key to providing a diagnostic yield. Preoperative ancillary testing should be done to the best of use before you take up these patients for surgery. And you don't have to really wait for controlling the inflammation prior to PPV in this era of microincision, which is surgery. We need to remove the vitreous efficiently and because these eyes are inflamed, so avoid induction of posterior vitreous detachment if it is not detached. But if it is detached, good for us, we remove the complete hyaloid. This is to minimize collateral retinal damage and fluidic stability is paramount to avoid any intraocular complications. Instruments must be as lowly invasive as possible, but capable of meeting the demands of surgery. So, of course, all the surgery in uveitis is a teamwork by the uh, uveitis specialist and microbiologist and cytop cytopathologist when it comes to diagnosis. But it, when it comes to offering the patient a visual uh, rehab, of course, the cataract surgeons and the VR surgeons. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was a very lucid talk and you showed us some very excellent cases and videos uh, and there were so many learning points and uh, we really uh, appreciate your time and effort in making this presentation. Uh, so ma'am, before we go on to the questions, I think Subhav has an uh, announcement to make. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I have a very small announcement to make at this juncture. Uh, on 24th of March, we have the OSCE in uh, so we request all the participants and the interested uh, individuals to please send in their contact numbers by tomorrow morning uh, for the OSCE session. Ma'am, over to you for all the questions now. Yes. Uh, ma'am, we'll start with the questions. Dr. Reema, ma'am. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, the first question is, uh, which, uh, investigations require diluted vitreous samples or probably which uh, indications require diluted vitreous samples? You know, I would put it the other way. Mm -hmm. If you think of an investigation, anybody would ask for an undiluted vitreous sample because that is the maximum lead uh, yield. So if you say which requires uh, diluted vitreous sample, I would put it the other way. Which investigation should be done on the undiluted vitreous sample. So that's a better way of putting. So if you have an undiluted sample, it's a precious sample, limited in amount. So we should subject it depending upon what our concerns are. So if it's a masquerade and you're suspecting a malignancy, um, the undiluted sample should go to the cytologist first. So you, and then the, then you have to prioritize. So if you're not suspecting any, um, malignancy, any masquerade, then your main concern would be probably PCRs. Then what kind of PCR are you suspecting TB over viral and others? Then you would preserve that sample for, you know, TB PCR. So it depends upon what is your index of suspicion. And first on your differential diagnosis, accordingly, you will prioritize your samples. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, thank you, ma'am. The next question, these questions are from, ma'am, uh, postgraduate students mostly who are following us on uh, all the social media platforms on YouTube, Facebook, they are listening to your lecture. So uh, the second question is uh, transcleral versus endoretinal approach for retinochoroidal biopsy. What are the uh, advantages and disadvantages of both? Um, the advantages of internal approach, which is pars plana vitrectomy, are way above an external approach because it's a controlled surgery. A vitreous surgery is a controlled surgery, right? You have your infusion on, you have a, you're operating under a closed system. And because of this microincision vitreous surgery, the instrumentation is same, safe, your fluidics have to be uh, titrated. So you everything is under your control. Tamponading is easy. 
um, chances of hemorrhagic uh, complications are much more with the external and external is kind of you know more of a blinded approach so in internal approach a vitreous approach you're doing everything under direct visualization so you know where your lesion is you know where your exudates are so you know where you are you know targeting your sampling yes very important points uh, the next question is what are the absolute contraindications for performing a diagnostic vitrectomy absolute contraindication contraindication A media opacity. I mean, if you can't see, you can't operate. So if you have bad cornea, if you have a dense cataract, but then we would suggest get the cataract surgery done first. And uh, I don't see any um, contraindication. If the patient doesn't agree, uh, I won't even say one-eyed because one-eyed patients, we do have a lot of one-eyed patients and we go in for surgery. So you need to have the, cons uh, you need to have the consent of the patient you need to have an indication and, of course, the expertise. So, yeah, if it can be operated, why not? Yes, so, there's nothing like an absolute contraindication, but I would suggest that if you're able to make a clinical diagnosis based on your phenotype and your investigations, I think you should not attempt a diagnostic vitrectomy just for the sake of it. You should attempt it only if you think that you're going to have give a therapeutic effect to the patient. So if you want to debulk the vitreous, it's fine. But for diagnostic purposes, no. If you already have enough clues from your clinical and laboratory or ancillary testing. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so the next question is about intraocular lenses. Uh, ma'am, what are the suitable IOLs for ubiotic patients? Uh, you know, uh, we don't recommend in... Uh, um, GIA patients in children. Yes. And, yeah. And uh, since we don't, we ourselves are not operating these patients, our cataract surgeons are operating these patients. So um, it is the surgeons, the cataract surgeon who decides uh, the lens. So multifocals again are a strict no no. We don't recommend, though we have seen a couple of cases where multifocal ions have been uh, implanted. So they shouldn't be operated, they shouldn't be implanted in these eyes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Partho, sir, you uh, do a lot of cataracts. So uh, what's your yeah, opinion Patho, about the type of IOL? Yeah, mainly we don't advocate use of silicon or uh, hydrophilic uh, material because there are a lot of deposition of the inflammatory cells over that. So these are the, the things we usually use. The main challenge is, you know, uh, these eyes again develop posterior sinecae in the post-operative uh, and then there are chances of optic capture and you know this subluxated lens and uh, the haptic going haywire so a uh, lot of uh, factors uh, to be kept in mind this point of the eye will inside the bag is the most important in this yeah. patient because if you have it in the um, sulcus i think then you're increasing the chances of optic capture and post-operative you know pigment dispersion and uh, sinecae and a uh, lot of things so if you're putting it in the um, bag, that's the best you can do. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the next question. In a GIA patient with uh, band-shaped uh, keratopathy not responding to topic EDTA, what should be the ideal surgical approach for BSK, ma'am? Not responding to? Topical uh, EDTA therapy. They scrape it off, ma'am. They put uh, EDTA and scrape it off the BSK. Yeah. The cornea surgeons do that. Actually, yeah. this is a. So we do that also. It works very well. But uh, we also have the corneal uh, uh, debriders, you know, that work very well. You just uh, rotate it on the surface of the BSK and it does wonders. Parthasar, you have any experience? No, patient is not responding to EDTA? No, I usually send this patient to my cornea colleague. So yes, sir. I won't be able to tell that. Okay. So this they have this uh, rotator, the debrider, which uh, just works in seconds. And uh, that's was even better than EDTA. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Uh, 
So we'll go on to the next question. In an uh, inactive case, what should be the ideal protocol for using pre-op steroids? In an inactive case, so yes. depending, yeah. So um, one day prior to the surgery, the that's what we recommend. And that's what our cataract colleagues usually do. They usually start the patient on a pre-op steroids. It may not be full dose of one milligram per kg per day. So you can put the patient on 0.5 milligram because this is a prophylactic dose. So we're not giving a therapeutic dose. So 0.5 milligram per kg per day of oral steroids. And then once the patient is operated and post-op period is uneventful, you can taper them fast and maybe... Uh, uh, if nothing is happening and it's purely an interior uveitis or an intermediate uveitis, I think you can stop over the next two weeks, tapering and stopping. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, which topical steroid do you prefer? In Here, in we, it varies. You know, cataract surgeons uh, use uh, predacetate. We use beta-methazone neomycin combinations. So many... Uh, uh, surgeons use a combination of an antibiotic and dexamethasone, you know, antibiotic DX combinations. So I think it is uh, the surgeon's um, preference. Yeah. Yes. So we are going, we are doing well. Now the last question, what should be the ideal approach for an intumescent mature cataract with active uveitis? Operate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, you, have no uh, choice. you have no choice. Yeah, there's operate, no choice. Yeah, you operate and this cover of steroids. Uh, orally as well as toxins. You would like to add anything, Partho sir? No, if it is not fuchs, if it is fuchs, then you don't have to use steroid. Mm -hmm. Okay, so actually ma'am has answered most of the questions in her talk. So Correct. there are not many questions and we still have 15 minutes. So ma'am, would you like to just say something that you'd like to share? Uh, anything that the PG should know for the exam or uh, about uveitis, anything? I have a question for you. When you do retinotomy in these cases, like some cases like acute retinal necrosis or some cases, no, you usually perform retinotomy. So retinotomy so, is required in, if the patient has a retinal detachment. Okay. So if we are basically going in for a therapeutic purpose, a complication. So you have a retinal detachment and you have to drain the subretinal fluid. So we make a retinotomy. Or if you are collecting the subretinal aspirates in a suspected lymphoma, so we make a retinal a retinotomy there on the surface where the you know maximum exudates are there. So that's for um, that's basically more I would say retinectomy, a localized retinectomy because we want the retinal tissue also. So we excise a bit of retinal tissue there. So that acts as a retinotomy, a retinectomy. We laser that and we get the um, uh, sample. So basically, any um, uh, retinal detachments with a regmatogenous component, combined retinal detachment. Fractional retinal detachment, we don't have to make retinotomy. They uh, do well after relief of the fraction. Another question I have, ma'am, uh, that in silicon field eye, uh, do you recommend injecting ozudex or any kind of intravitreal uh, steroid? Not really. I Since I don't do it, I won't recommend. Okay. okay. I've heard of people doing it and trying it, but um, no. You don't recommend. Okay. No. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, just one more question has come up. Uh, what are implants used in, used in uveitic cases? Uh, injectable. Yeah, maybe, ma'am, because they have not clarified. This is just a question implant, that has come up. In was the, regarding the IOL which Partho has answered. And yeah, maybe they are asking about intravitreal implants. So, Ozodex? Hmm. Uh, Ozotex and uh, maybe they are asking about the uh, fluosinolone uh, implant which we are not using in India. But uh, Only Ozotex. Hmm. Some people give intravitreal, then it comes to, you know, intravitreal injections. People give intravitreal uh, triamcinolone also. 
Hmm. If the Ozodex is not available or the patient cannot afford, but with the, with, with the efficacy and safety of Ozodex, I think Ozodex is much preferred over um, Triamcinone yes, because Triamcinone has a very high risk of you know a recalcitrant glaucoma. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now finally the last question: uh, How to manage cyclitic membranes, ma'am? Yeah, so cyclitic membranes are picked up on UBM. And we have to be very sure for how many quadrants the cyclotic membrane is there. So essentially, if we take up, these are the patients who have complicated cataract also. So these are the patients who are undergoing uh, lincectomy and vitrectomy and cyclotic membrane dissection. So we follow a translimbal route in these patients. We don't go pars plena. So I think I forgot to mention this in other route. Because, because there is ciliary body, once you have a cyclotic membrane, that means your ciliary body is shut down. You have a lot of complications. So if you go by a pars plana route, you're you know, damaging the eye and you end up in complications. So once you are planning a patient for cyclotic membrane dissection, we go translimbal. We remove the cataract and the eye becomes a fake it. And then we 360 degrees, we depress the area of the pars plicata and plana and then start dissecting the uh, cyclotic membrane. So we use scissors depending upon how bad they are, how vast they are, um, or a cutter. This is the approach. And then do a vitrectomy. And uh, these eyes have hypotony. So we uh, fill these eyes for functional stability of the eyes and to give some vision to the patient because invariably they have um, you know, disc edema, hypotonic maculopathy. So we fill these eyes with uh, uh, silicone oil and leave them a fake egg. Okay. Uh, thank you, ma'am. So, thank you so much for your uh, patience, ma'am. You patiently answered all the questions from the students who are listening to the talk. And thank you again for your time and effort. And with that, uh, we'll go on to Subha for the announcements. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, at the uh, conclusion of this session, I would really like to thank Reema Bansal, ma'am, for taking her precious time out for all of us. And on behalf of Dr. Honawa's team at iFocus here, we would uh, uh, really like to thank you for the wonderful videos produced. And we had a complete encyclopedia and a oh, eagle's eye view on the topic today, ma'am. Thank you so much for it. Uh, may I request Dr. JB, sir, to uh, please comment upon today's session? I think is that a wonderful session. And there's a nice video, particularly the sample taking uh, and then sample uh, giving the importance to the sample. And uh, particularly in the lymphoma is of paramount importance. And uh, as you correctly told that when the sample is small, the cytology should go fast in case of a neoplastic uh, lesion and um, the suspected neoplasm. And... Uh, I also agree with him that in JIA that uh, in the my experience is that those who have put the IOL, uh, it uh, over the years uh, what I see that one it didn't work out well. Mm, it's a lot of complications. Uh, I don't know that one is uh, I don't I recommend uh, uh, IOL implantation in JIA patient unless it's over twenty years of age and quite uh, this is uh, uh, this is one of the lessons uh, which has been very much reinforced nicely. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Very wonderful lecture. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, Partho. Thank you, Abhilashna. Before, before we uh, so call it a day we today. really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Yeah. Before we call it a day today, I would like to make the announcement for the next week. On the 24th of March, we meet for the OSCE session in UVA by Dr. Minija and Dr. Veda uh, Rajesh and uh, hope to see you all there for a lovely session. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night, ma'am. Good night.